All right. Uh, welcome aboard. Thanks for coming out uh, tonight again. And uh, why do we do what we do in the divine service? And uh, we'll be looking at uh, some summary tonight and mostly we'll be looking at what the propers are, the calendar, um, hymnody, and um, what does worship look like in heaven? And we'll start with that first. Uh, so we'll start with a word of prayer and we'll begin then. Almighty God, you hate nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> so this is the picture that we've been kind of using over the last number of weeks that we've been doing this Bible study just to kind of um, give us a sense of the divine service and everything that it's about. Because here we see the the essentials to the divine service. We see the shape of the divine service, uh, word and sacrament. Um, and this is an image you, you want to keep in mind when you're thinking about uh, what is kind of the basic elements of the Lutheran divine service. All right. So let's look at what worship looks like in heaven. And we there are a number of pictures in, in the Bible of what worship looks like in heaven, uh, but I've picked out two, uh, and I think you're probably familiar with both of them, um, but I just, I'll read them briefly and we can comment on them. And why we're doing that is because um, our, our worship on earth in the church should match what worship in heaven is like. Of course, it's it's a mere shadow of that, but nevertheless, we're kind of guided by uh, worship in heaven as it is on earth, right? Um, that's how we want it to be. So we have Isaiah's vision of the Lord in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, and he has this vision of the throne room. So this is Old Testament, uh, 600 years before the birth of Christ. So in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and on the uh, train of his robe filled the temple. Uh, above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, which two covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Um, and of course, that's imagery that's very hard for us to kind of understand beyond what is right there. Um, the throne room, it's interesting. When I was a, a young man, when I was 19 years old, I had my first trip to Germany and went to uh, castle Neuschwanstein. Uh, it's in Bavaria, and it's the castle that the Cinderella Castle in Disney World is based after. And what happened was uh, King Ludwig, who had built this castle, ran out of money. Um, and the thing that was not finished was the throne room. So the throne room has uh, this grand um, a lamp above where the throne is supposed to be. There's gold embellishments on on the the walls and the ceilings and yet there sit in the the round apse at the end of the room uh there is no throne they ran out of money to buy a throne uh so in heaven there is a a, a throne um and then i'm just thinking of another throne if you go to westminster abbey in london you can see the throne that every king of england and scotland has sat on uh, sat upon for every coronation since the 11th century or something. So um, there is a royal nature to heaven. And when you're in the presence of, of royalty in a throne room, there is a sense of reverence and awe. Um, so what does that look like? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We find this then in the divine service, don't we? Holy, holy, holy. Um, in the Holy Communion, uh, as as the Lord is entering into the Holy Communion after the proper preface, I believe. Uh, the foundations of uh, threshold shook at the voice of him who called. The house was filled with smoke. Uh, and of course, you could take that smoke as any number of things, but in the church, uh, certainly the use of incense as um, a, a symbol of our prayers lifting up to heaven uh, so there you can see an application to our worship in this world, our divine service. Uh, then there's a confession. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost from a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. There is a sense of awe. 
Um, there's a sense of being in the presence of perfection and holiness. And what that does then is reflects back on us and we are driven to our knees in repentance because we are not that. Uh, so there is an aspect of the divine service here where we have confession. We're entering into, and we've talked about this before, that the church is the embassy of heaven, that the divine service is um, a, a foretaste of the feast to come, a foretaste of of what heaven heavenly worship is like. Uh, then one of the seraphim, verse 6, flew to me and having his hand on a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. Holy absolution. And we've talked about how for the Lutheran divine service, the center of everything that we do is justification by faith. That is the free forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ received by faith, um, apart from works of the law. And so we see this sense of that uh, in heavenly worship. And so that should also be our sense in our divine service. The center of everything is justification by faith, uh, apart from works of the law. Christ is at the center and he is for us. Uh, then verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Uh, and we talked about what is one of the essential things that we need for the divine service. Well, we need a preacher. And so we have a picture here below uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to six, one to 8, of a Lutheran divine service with the preacher up front, with the dear saints in the pews, the pulpit to the right. Uh, the altar behind him, crucifix, and uh, uh, proclaiming the gospel. Uh, so this is one of the essentials of the divine service. We need someone to declare the um, word of God. So heavenly worship. One more time uh, on heavenly worship. We'll go to the New Testament to the end of the Bible. Uh, Revelation 17, I believe it is. Um, after this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. So uh, we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So that church means that um, we are all one in Christ of every ethnic group, language, tribe. Um, our unity is in Christ. And that unity in, tr in Christ transcends national boundaries, ethnic boundaries, any of that stuff. Um we're all one in Christ from every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages. And they're what? Standing before the throne and before the lamb. That's interesting too, because uh, we're in Isaiah six, we're driven to our knees in repentance, but before the lamb, we're also able to stand before God because of what Christ has done for us. Right. The, um, God, the father, um, when he judges us, uh, sees his son Jesus in our place. And therefore we can stand before God. Um, we are still in awe, in reverence, in fear, of course, but uh, because of the Lamb of God, we're able to stand before the Lord, clothed in white robes. And um, the white robes, of course, there's that baptismal imagery there, baptism. Um, there's that also that sense of later on um, of uh, martyrdom, of being a witness for Christ and and uh, those who have suffered and died for the faith are then clothed in white robes. Uh, whenever we think of white robes, the image is of sainthood, of, of righteousness, and that, that righteousness that we have comes to us from Christ. And so what do they have in their hands? Palm branches, uh, as we will have in 96 hours. On Palm Sunday, we'll have palm branches in our hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne Again, more imagery, that royal imagery, that throne room imagery, uh, and to the Lamb. Uh, there's angels and uh, all sorts of praise for um, uh, the Lamb of God, Jesus, who takes away the sins of the world. Um, verse 17 at the bottom, uh, heavenly worship is in great joy uh, because God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Uh, there'll be no more suffering, no more death, um, you know, no more mourning. Um, amen, as you read brother, in amen. Revelation 21. Go ahead, Miriam. I said, amen, brother. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, that's, that is our sure and certain hope. That's our, our glorious vision of things to come given to us by faith. 
Uh, the picture here is just a, a Lutheran divine service. Again, this is a foretaste of what you're reading in Revelation of heavenly worship. Uh, it's imperfect. Uh, it's, it's but a shadow of what is to come. But nevertheless, it is that thin place where Jesus is there and promises to be there for us in word and sacrament to serve us um, with his grace and his mercy and forgiveness and, and all of those things that give um, life, hope, and salvation. Um, so yeah, that heavenly worship is is modeled, or our, our divine service here on earth is modeled after heavenly worship, um, and as it's been described, is a thin place between uh, the church militant, that's us, and the church triumphant. Let's look at the church calendar for a little bit. I did another video a few years ago on the church calendar, uh, but this is one of the things that affects the divine service. Uh, you can kind of see the church year here. Um, what this does is it brings us into the life of Christ. The church calendar is based on the life of Christ. We find ourselves presently in the season of Lent. Uh, here we are. Uh, where a lot of our, the last number of Sundays, our lessons have dealt with um, the cross. Um, I think it was a couple Sundays ago, we sang the hymn, Lift High the Cross. Uh, we talked about the cross last Sunday. This Sunday, of course, will be Palm Sunday, the entrance of Jesus in Jerusalem. Uh, but we will conclude the service uh, with the reading of the Passion Story this year from St. Mark. Um that'll bring us into Easter and resurrection season, then Pentecost. And then there's that ordinary time. Uh, there's that regular rhythm of time of, of word and sacrament of gathering around uh, those things in the church. Uh, and of course, we've talked a lot about Advent and Christmas and Epiphany. So again, brings us into the life of Christ. The image here I have at the left is, you know, uh, in Western Christendom. So in the years before the Reformation and after the Reformation, up until about the 1700s, the life of the the, cal the calendar in the church, uh, the life of the world revolved around, at least the Western world, revolved around the church calendar. And so, um, for example, there you have a, a medieval picture of Candlemas. So Candlemas on February 2nd um, wasn't just some trivial Groundhog Day. But it was a major day when people went to church. There was a festival afterwards of feasting. Uh, there wasn't any work to be had. People would bring their candles to be blessed. Um, there was a sense of uh, churchly community around the calendar. Uh, there were a lot more feast days. And these things affected people's lives. And, and so I should also say for Lent. Lent was very austere. We would consider it very austere. And um, um, so over here on the left, you have the principal festivals of the church, of course, coming up Easter Day, the Ascension of our Lord, which is 50 days after Easter, Pentecost, Holy Trinity, and uh, Christmas Day. Notice not Christmas Eve. The principal festival for Christmas is Christmas Day, the 25th, and then Epiphany, which is probably the second oldest day on the church calendar behind Easter. Uh, those are days that are all biblical and they're all um, principal commemorations on the church calendar. Then all Sundays of the church year are festivals of our Lord Jesus Christ because they are all little Easter's. I mean, we gather on Sunday primarily because that is the day of resurrection. That's the Easter Sunday every day, every day every Sunday of the year. So even in the season of Lent, uh, the fasting is, is reduced on Sundays because that's a day of resurrection. Uh, that's a day of celebration. I once had some lady at the Leercrons really argue with me about this. I don't know what her problem was, but I tried to tell her, I'm like, hey lady, every Sunday is a day of resurrection. And she's like, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, go go back to your brought verse. Um, <laughs> days of special devotion. Uh, Ash Wednesday, and of course, Days of Holy Week, which are coming up for us. Uh, then there's lesser festivals, um, such as the Holy Name of Jesus. That's the 1st of January, which is, again is a biblical day. It's the eighth day after Christmas. The Annunciation, which is coming up um, in just a few days, March 25th, um, nine months before Christmas. Uh, on March 25th, we will commemorate 
the angel Gabriel coming to the Virgin Mary. And in ancient times, that's when the year began. Um, our calendar is fairly recent. You know, it goes back to the 1700s. Uh, but previous to that, the Annunciation was really key to uh, the calendar, uh, even the civic calendar. Uh, and then there's a number of Apostles' Days, um, like St. John, which is the December 27th. Um, the Confession of St. Peter in January, the Conversion of St. Paul. And then for us Lutherans, uh, Reformation Day is peculiar to our calendar. I bring all these up because the divine service looks different for each of these days, and the calendar certainly affects what we do and, and how the divine service looks. Um, the creeds. So one of the unique things in the Lutheran Church is that... Um, we do, on Holy Communion Sundays, occasionally use the Apostles' Creed. Uh, our rubric, our kind of, um, uh, that word rubric means kind of like the regulation or the, the uh, expectation, is that the Apostles' Creed is used on Sundays when the color is green. So generally, we'll use that throughout the summer and during uh, the Sundays after Epiphany. Uh, it's the shorter of the three creeds. Um, again, that's kind of unique to the Lutheran Church, as far as I know, uh, because it's the Nicene Creed, the longer of the two, that is customarily said at all services Holy Communion. Um, we're saying the, the Nicene Creed now in Lent, and again, that's customarily the creed that's used whenever we have Holy Communion. Um, we do have the Athanasian Creed, so this is, we have three creeds in the church. Um, and the Athanasian Creed is said on Holy Trinity Sunday. That's pretty unique to Lutherans, too. Um, for our United Methodist friends, they do not have the Athanasian Creed. I didn't grow up with the Athanasian Creed. I had never heard of the Athanasian Creed until it came among you good folks. Um, it is the longest of the three creeds. And uh, so we usually um, say that responsively, if you recall, on Holy Trinity Sunday. So why creeds? Well, the creeds are placed after the, the sermon, and they represent or they are our response to the word having been heard. Um, so we're standing up. There's a reason why we stand up when the creeds come to that part of the service. We're standing up because we're confessing what we believe as a church. This is what we're about. This is what we believe. And um, and we know that if we're ever hauled before some sort of trial court or or whatever to defend our beliefs, um, this is what we want to be able to recite clearly and boldly. And so that's why the church has that there after the sermon, uh, one of those three creeds. And uh, we want to certainly memorize the Apostles' Creed because that's basic Christianity. That's what Christians believe, teach, and confess, and have since the days of the Apostles. And that's why it's named that. The Nicene Creed's named after the um, the Council of Nicaea, which convened in 325 AD as a result of some controversies in the church about what we were to believe about Jesus. And the Athanasian Creed is named after St. Athanasius, but he didn't write it. Uh, it's named in his honor. Um, and it's a little bit, I guess, around the time of the Nicene Creed. I don't know exactly. I'd have to look that up. But uh, those are our three creeds. Any comments or thoughts on the creeds? Did you learn the Apostles' Creed in confirmation class? Do you remember this? Yes. Yeah. 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 Did you have to stand in front of the church and, and recite it in front of everybody? I don't no, remember. I, I did. You did? I did not have to. No. You did not have to. Yeah, I um I know that there's some churches that make their uh, their confirmation students do that. It just seems like that's terrifying for some people. I don't know. Maybe I'm a softy. I, they they have to recite it to me, um, and uh, you know, then we I just let church council know that they're they're good to go. Um, but usually the night the apostles' creed is not hard to memorize because again we're saying it for a good portion of the year. And I think I read somewhere that the reason why as Lutherans we have the apostles' creed in those those seasons of ordinary time and um, during the Sundays after Epiphany is because it's so central to our learning the small catechism. 
And so that's the second part of the small catechism. Uh, we want to keep that in the mix so that uh, we don't forget it and, uh, you know, keep it fresh in our minds. Um, not that the Nicene Creed, you know, shouldn't be memorized as well. So, all right. So one of the things that happens during the divine service is the propers. The propers are the things that change from week to week in the divine service. So we have a basic format of, we talked about the shape of the divine service being word and sacrament. That's the shape of it. And we talked about that there are things that are there every time we gather. But there are things that do change from week to week. And here you have a list. Uh, the hymns generally change from week to week. The collect, that's the, the first prayer of the day. Um, uh, that's said at the beginning no. of the service. That changes every week. There is a collect for every Sunday and festival of the church year. Um, the prayers of the church generally change from week to week. Um, Although there are set prayers that can be used every Sunday, um, for example, like the Book of Common Prayer that comes to us from the Episcopal Church or the, the Anglican Church. Um, the lessons, those change every time we gather. Um, and generally, there's four lessons, the Old Testament, the Epistle, and then there'll be a psalm. In many churches, the psalms are chanted or sung, uh, and then there will always be a gospel lesson. Um we use a three-year lectionary. The lectionary is the readings, the lessons assigned by the church that correspond to the church calendar. If you're in church every Sunday for three years, you will have heard read about 85% of the Bible. Um, some, some of the sections of the Bible are left out. A number of the genealogies are left out, things like that from the lectionary. But if you do come every Sunday for three years, You'll hear about 85% of the Bible read. Um, and of course, the sermon is always there, but it should change from week to week. Uh, the pastor's preaching the same sermon every week. Um, that, that could be an issue. And then service music. Uh, so I'm thinking of like the proper preface, um, like the holy, 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 um, like the, the nook dimitis at the end, Lord, now let your servant go in peace. Um, these are service Parts and those change from from week to week. They they can stay for the season, but they they can change as well. Um, then the ordinaries. These are the things that stay in place week to week, and in general terms, the invocation, the confession and absolution, um, what happens from the pulpit, the reading of the le the lessons, the preaching, as I mentioned, the altar. Uh, the blessing at the end. There are a couple different blessings that we can use in the church. The Aaronic blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you from uh, numbers in the Old Testament. And of course, the Trinitarian blessing, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, those change, those are considered propers, but there will always be a blessing. And then, of course, the general order of the liturgy, the shape of the liturgy, pretty much stays the same uh, week to week. Um, you may recall before the year 2000 at Salem Church, um, that's the year that we brought in weekly Holy Communion. Um, we may have had communion maybe the first Sunday of the month. Um, the service then would go to the sermon and the creed, the hymn of the day, and I think like the Lord's Prayer and then the blessing. Um, so it was it was kind of truncated that way. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um but nevertheless, it was it was a divine service without Holy Communion. Is that correct? As far as I know, yeah. That's yeah. Right. Okay. Now, before you go, I can't help but point this out. Yeah. The bottom left of the picture, the second pew in, sits Peter Schiffer. Where? Bottom Here. left. Yeah. That Peter Schiffer. <laughs> Well, I will let him know that uh, he's uh, in the picture. Uh, I, I had to tell you that. I saw that a couple of weeks ago. I'll let him know. Um, just to let you know that this is kind of an interesting church here. I've never been here, but um, here is the, the altar. And then here is a doorway. And then there's steps. This is the pulpit. And then you come from behind the curtain to the pulpit here. But here's where, where did you say there. the church is. It's somewhere in Germany. I've never been oh, there. Oh, Germany. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to get some kind of classic Lutheran architecture um, for some of these pictures. 
All right. So music. Uh, Jim Kimmel can't be with us tonight. Uh, he has a family obligation, but this is for uh, Jim, for all of us. Uh, here's I have some quotes that I pulled for um, um, from Martin Luther on uh, music. So here they are. Next to the word of God, music deserves the highest praise. I agree with him. <laughs> OK, here's another one. Music creates joyful hearts. Mm -hmm. Here's another one uh, in 1530. Except for theology, music alone produces what otherwise only theology can do, namely a calm and joyful disposition. Um, Martin Luther felt that music in the service, um, not only does it provide uh, praise for us to sing back to the Lord, um, but it also raises our hearts, comforts us. I mean, think about, I, there are a couple musical moments at Salem Church that really always kind of get to me. One is Silent Night on Christmas Eve. The other one is when we sing uh, Amazing Grace. When we sing Amazing Grace at Salem Church, it just, it's very powerful for me. Um, it's it's a powerful hymn. And music does, it's uplifting most times. <laughs> and um, Luther would go on to say that uh, it drives away our despair and, and the devil himself. And amazing grace is even more powerful when you know the story behind it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so, and there's any number of other hymns. Um, I mean, think about the different emotions. So if I say like um, a mighty fortress, there's, there's kind of a militancy to it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, it's like, we are here and we are marching for the Lord. When I sing, uh, when we sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, there's this joyfulness. There's, um, um, uh, there's this uh, excitedness about the Lord's uh, word to us that we want to spread that. Um, what are some of your favorite hymns? Well, you named them. Did I, I, could, well, I could give you a list of that that's long, like long, you wouldn't want to sit and listen to it. But there's okay. Well, can you pull out a couple? Another one came to think, and I don't know the titles. I never was able to keep titles, but the one we sing where it says, um, who shall go? And here I am, Lord. Send oh, me. that's a more modern one, the, the here I am, yeah. Lord, right? And that's based on Isaiah 6. Uh-huh. That we we heard at the beginning here, yeah. That's a little bit more modern, isn't that in the uh, the with one voice, the blue hymnal? Uh, it's possible. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um. So the hymn of the day comes after the sermon, uh, and this, in my experience, is a uniquely Lutheran liturgical provision. The hymn of the day. I mean, other other traditions will have a hymn after the sermon, but I don't think anyone calls it the hymn of the day. Um, there's a lot of pressure on that hymn because that hymn of the day is um, supposed to encapsulate the tone of the service, the the main point of the service. It's supposed to uh, supposed to encapsulate the lessons read, the season of the year, the commemoration, and the sermon all in one hymn. And uh, a lot of times, Teresa, our, our organist, is very good at at choosing that that hymn of the day. Uh, and but again, that's one of the propers of the service. Um, we always have a hymn of the day, but that changes from week to week, from service to service. Um. And then uh, another point here, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, the essential essential aspect of the Lutheran divine service is justification by faith. So our hymns that we sing should reflect this central doctrine of our faith. And so as a congregation, we want to discern how and what our hymns and praise songs convey. Uh, that's important for us because there's some bad hymns that really... Um, our kind of works righteousness stuff that we want to be careful about. And then there's a lot of beautiful hymns that really are uplifting and and hold up um, the great comforting doctrine of justification by faith. Um, and then finally, hymns and our and our singing of praise songs, uh, the service parts, um, like the offertory, these are songs and hymns and prayer praise songs that are that are given in response to having heard, uh, having received and heard the gospel. Uh, so it's almost um, when we we're talking about incense, you know, you think about the the smoke of the censer raising up to heaven. 
Um, we can think of our hymns as the same thing. And of course, there we're also singing to each other. We're singing praises to the Lord, but we're also singing to each other to encourage one another um, uh, and to give, you know, as Luther says, um, give one another joyful hearts in the Lord. And um, for Lutherans back in the Reformation, this was huge because congregational singing wasn't a major part of congregational life prior to the Reformation. And Luther and the fellow, his fellow reformers introduced congregational singing, and it was powerful. Uh, there is a scene in the movie Luther that came out in um, 2005 or six or whenever it was, where uh, when Luther was standing on, on trial in Worms, uh, all of the cardinals and princes and dukes could hear out the windows uh, the Lutherans, or, or Luther supporters, I should say, singing hymns. And that was very powerful because that was a marker of identity for the early Lutherans. This was later um, also recaptured among the Methodists. Um, congregational singing in England and in colonial America had really kind of fallen by the wayside. And Charles Wesley, uh, John's brother, great hymn writer, and a lot of the Methodist movement uh, in the um, 18th century was uh, really driven by beautiful hymnody by Charles Wesley um, and John Wesley. Um, and uh, the Methodists were known for their singing as well. And that's, you can hear my bias here. Uh, I love Methodist hymnody and uh, oh, for a thousand times, I think is probably my favorite hymn, Charles Wesley. Um, the communion. Um, there is a, a response to this, you know, the sursum corda, lift up your hearts. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, right? Um, we remember that Christianity is a religion of joy. And uh, we're lifting our hearts in thanksgiving for uh, the blessed sacrament that is to be received very shortly. Um, yeah, and then, of course, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We say that because Jesus is coming to visit us in body and blood, in the Holy Communion. And at the distribution, we come forward and Lutherans generally kneel, although, as you heard in Revelation, they stand as well. And this is a responsive act. So the body of Christ given for you, and then the response is, Amen. It is so. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. It is so. Uh, the Holy Communion itself, the liturgy, it doesn't change a whole lot. Uh, we can use um, beyond the words of institution. Uh, that's just the, the words that Jesus speaks. Uh, there is a longer Holy Communion uh, order that has a little bit fuller theological understanding of Holy Communion, and we'll be using that at Easter. Um, but usually during ordinary time or Lent, we'll use the shorter words of institution. Any thoughts or comments on that? In terms of the bread used, we use kind of this Greek flatbread currently. When I got to Salem, we were using um, bread from uh, uh, Martin's store, which was kind of neat because it was locally baked. Um, we use bread, and um, uh, we're free to use any kind of bread. The church may, I think, in some circles say that you have to use unleavened bread. Um, there are wafers that I think are unleavened. In terms of wine, uh, the church uh, can use any sort of wine. And it's interesting, if you go into the Midwest, <clears throat> a lot of Lutheran churches will use... Uh, one moment. A lot of Lutheran churches will use white wine. Because um, they want to make themselves distinctive from those who say Holy Communion is just a representative sign. So to use a, a red wine um, is to say like this represents the body of Christ. They use a white wine in um, kind of defiance to that. Uh, it's kind of a Midwest thing, I think. Uh, we use a red wine and that's fine. It's a uh, bottom shelf Pennsylvania State Store wine because the good Lord can use that just as he uses regular effort to tap water in baptism. Well, I, don't, 
I don't know that it matters, but I'm wondering how white wine looks like blood. It doesn't have to look like blood. That's their point. Oh, okay. Um, because it's the word, um, it's the word of promise attached to the wine. I see. And, yeah. And then the distribution, you know, we generally kneel or stand. Um, there's usually a rail, but there doesn't have to be. Um, and um, we use laity in the assistance of Holy Communion. Some churches do not. Um, you know, these things um, were free in Christ. There's a lot of leeway in these things. Um, yeah. Any uh, thoughts or comments on the Holy Communion? So... Um, that brings us to to the conclusion here at 745. Again, our final picture here. This is the picture I want to leave you with of uh, to the Lutheran Divine Service. Um, as you know, our service is to to match what's happening in heaven, or at least be a shadow of that, a foretaste of the feast to come, uh, and word and sacrament of, of the dear saints gathered around. Uh, any kind of uh, final comments or questions on why we do what we do in the divine service. We could have gone much more in depth on this. This is kind of an overview over five weeks. I think we had to cancel one. I was sick. Um, but any comments or questions? About the hymns, the, you the, you were uh, talking about the, the Methodist hymns. Do we have any of those hymns in our hymnal? We do, yeah. We have a number of Charles Wesley hymns in the, uh, oh. uh, in the Lutheran Book of Worship here. Um, yeah, there's a number of Methodist hymns, of course, a lot of Lutheran hymns. We have a lot of Roman Catholic hymns in here. Uh, so one of the Roman Catholic hymns that I can think of right off the top of my head is um, uh, Faith of Our Fathers. Uh, comes to us from the Roman Catholics. And I can tell you this, that uh, I, I've i seen, I've paged through some uh, Roman Catholic hymnals, and A Mighty Fortress shows up there. I think there's a few Mennonite hymns in there, too. Yeah, of course, right? Um, whereas you would not have found that kind of hymnody um, previous to the 1960s, maybe the 1950s, but that's a product of just having more connection with other churches. Uh, World War II was huge on this, World War I and World War II, because what happened was you had people from all over the country, different religious backgrounds or no religious at all, and they were all thrown together in this massive U.S. Army or military sent overseas and so you would have in a foxhole, you know, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, an atheist, and a Lutheran. And they talked to each other. And when they came back to the United States then, there was, after the war, or both wars, there was less a sense of, of living in a silo. Um, that the Mennonites had a lot to offer to us. And I believe that. And I think we have a lot to offer them. Uh, so there's that kind of cross-pollinization conversation kind of taking some of the best of different traditions and and maybe try to incorporate them into yours without losing your confessional identity thanks again Jeff, for all your work hey thanks for coming out uh I, we started the uh the bible study in the sunlight it looks like the sun is now set it's um and this is set on our bible study now too uh look for in-person bible study to resume in april 9 a.m uh, before the divine service uh, I really enjoy this. And uh, if you're interested in teaching a Bible study, let me know. If there's a topic you would like to talk about that you've thought about or had a question about, let me know. Um, we want to uh, make these Bible studies as engaging as we can. I really enjoy putting them together and um, and talking about them. I learn as much uh, from you as I, I, I do anywhere. So uh, thank you. Okay, you have a good night, Jeff. All, All right. right. God bless you. Thanks for coming out. You're welcome.